Welcome to our Crossing Archive. Here's where you can find all of our full services from our Crossing Online experience. This week we are in our series called Fake News. It's been an incredible series and I can't wait to get into it. But before that, we've got some incredible worship for you. Thanks for watching. You are my shepherd guiding me. You give me everything I need, oh, I know that you love me. You lay me down in pastures green, you lead me by the quiet streams, oh, I know that you love me. Jesus, you are good, and your love is Shelter and secure, Jesus, you are good, and your mercy's new. Every moment of my life, I will dwell in your house forever. Though I may walk in valleys deep, I stand in the midst of it. 
nothing satisfies, but I'm getting close, closer to the prize at the end of the rope. Hey, how's everybody doing today? You guys doing all right? Come on. So glad to be at church with each and every single one of you. To those of you who are joining from all of our different locations, to those of you who are joining through The Crossing online, thecrossing.tv, and of course, those of you with The Crossing inside, we love you guys. And of course, those of you who are joining for the very first time at all of our locations, we are so glad to have you here, and we hope that God uses the services this weekend to draw you into an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We are in a sermon series called Fake News. And as I was working on the sermon for this weekend, uh, my mind started wondering, and I was going, what would it be like if I was just walking down the streets of the Midwest and I uh, you know, ran across Jesus? Like, what would, that, uh, what would that be like? And since I'm a graduate, as you guys know, of YouTube University, uh, and I spend a, first of all, that's fake news. There isn't one yet, but uh, I do watch a lot of YouTube videos. Uh, I actually found this video. Now, these videos are a little old and maybe a little cheesy, but uh, I totally dig them. So I had to just like, I'm gonna share them with you. So imagine you are walking around the streets in a park and uh, you come up to a water fountain. What would happen if you came across Jesus at a water fountain in a park? Check out this video. <laughs> I love it. Uh, you know, what would it be like if you invited Jesus over to your, you know, to a swimming party and, you know, he's jumping off the, uh, the diving board and he forgets to go into the water? Like he just lands on top and then he just was, oh yeah, I forget. And he goes all the way under. Or uh, how about this one? Uh, I've, now I got another video for you. Imagine you are around Christmas time and, you know, people are used to ringing bells and there's money. Uh, people set aside a, a little booth to take in money for a good cause and that person has to go to the restroom and so they ask you to man the booth and then Jesus walks by. Check out this one. I totally want a t-shirt with Jesus doing, Jesus doing the Johnny Manziel. 
uh, there's another one I was going to show you, but I decided it probably wasn't the, the best one, but I, I can tell you about it. There's uh, this girl who's pretending that she has car problems, and she br- flags these guys over to help start her car. They can't get it started. Then Jesus comes by with a remote start and uh, goes like this, and the car immediately starts. And so all this happens for about six or seven different fellas. And then as soon as the car starts, because Jesus made it start, uh, the girl starts jumping up and down, and then she breaks a strap on her shoe. When she bends down to fix the strap, the guy's in the car that just got her car working, they check her out. And Jesus catches them and shuts the car back off. (laughs) Which might explain why some of you guys have been having car trouble, okay? Come to the steps. All right. Anyhow, uh, I wanted to take you through that because I think our view of Jesus and what it would be like to interact with Jesus is highly distorted. The fake news that we're going to be talking about today has your family, has your relationships, has your marriage, has your parenting by the throat. And many of us don't even know it. He keeps taking ground and moving in, and it has affected how you see yourself as a Christian, and more importantly, as a child of God. The fake news that we're talking about is live your life God is simply watching. Now there's a couple different ways that this kind of fleshes itself out. Uh, A while ago, Jay Leno, when he used to have his uh, evening show, he did a man on the street segment. And he would send them out and ask random people questions. And one particular night, he went out and he asked people uh, this question, name one of the 10 commandments. And the most common response was, God helps those who? Okay. Which is not a Ten Commandment and is nowhere in the Bible at all. But many of us, we actually believe that even subtly, that God really helps those who help themselves. Or another version of this is I can do whatever I want as long as I'm not hurting anyone or anything. It's okay. It's my life, I can do what I want as long as I don't hurt somebody or anything. But perhaps the toughest one that each of us wrestle with on a regular basis is who am I to tell somebody that the way that they're living their life is wrong? This is what this uh, looks like when you flesh it out in, uh, in your everyday life. You are hanging out with somebody and or maybe you just see somebody as you're going about your everyday life. And when you notice them, uh, this conversation starts playing through your head. Uh, Man, that person's uh, got it pretty rough. They obviously haven't been making some of the same decisions that I've been making and that's why I'm, I'm here and they're here. And then you go, well, you know, God helps those who help themselves, so it's a good thing that I, I did so much so God could help me. Because you've bought in the lie that your position and where you are in life is because of you and not because of him. Do you remember when you were in school, or maybe some of you have had this happen to you at work, where you have to do a group project? How many of all of our locations hate group projects? Those are all the kids who sit in the front (laughs) in the class. Because the reason I hate a group project is there's always that dumpy kid that just, uh, you know, didn't do a whole lot. Uh, His name was Chewy. (laughs) Chewy, if you're joining us at one of our locations, I remember. Okay? Uh, His name was Chewy. I'm not making that up. And you would work hard on your assignment, and you would bust your tail, and you would get it done. You'd turn it in and the dumpy kid wouldn't do anything. And when you got the A-plus back from the teacher, not only did you get it and everybody else who'd worked hard, Chewie got an A-plus too. And what we fail to recognize is that when it comes to like our life, we're the dumpy kid, and Jesus is the kid who sat in the front of the class and did all the work. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Uh, Your decisions... uh, impact uh, your life, and when you find Jesus, uh, it makes a difference as opposed to uh, some of the other things, but for the most part, where you are in your relationship with God has way more to do with him than it does with you. 
And the moment we start thinking that we're better than other people or that we've got more stuff figured out because we've done things differently, we lose sight of the fact that Jesus' payment on the cross was the same for the person we can't stand as it was for us. Or some of you, you you've bought into the lie, it's my life, I can, I can do whatever I want. I, I see this flesh out a lot with uh, kids when they start turning 18. You remember when you turned 18? Like all in function, in all reality, you could just buy a couple different things at the gas station and you could vote. Those are like the two big hurdles that happen when you turn 18 and all of a sudden you thought you ruled the world. And you'll hear parents sometimes you'll say, well, you're 18 now, so you can do what you want. No, no, you cannot just because you turned, you still have my last name, you still live in my house, uh, and for those of you who are gonna be parents of millennials, uh, they're not moving out anytime soon, okay? So listen to me, this is, while people are hating on this, this is good news to you for some of you. You're gonna get a longer opportunity to parent your child and coach them and get a longer swing on the ball, and I don't want you to waste that and if they're living in your house and you're letting them stay there and eat your food and have your last name and you're helping them out with their car insurance, or even if you're not, you live in this house, you're gonna do stuff my way. I don't care if the government says you can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want when you're living someplace else. And you get an opportunity to, to, to encourage them in the relationship with Jesus Christ for a longer period of time. But when someone goes, it's my life, I can do what I want as long as I'm not hurting anyone or anything, I'm just thinking how insignificant your life must be that it doesn't impact anybody. You'd be hard pressed to do something that doesn't impact somebody you care about. But the one that's probably the toughest is you find yourself sitting across the table, you're at a Starbucks or a McDonald's for breakfast, or maybe you're uh, with a coworker over a lunch break, or maybe it's more intimate than that. You're at your own home talking to a friend, a neighbor, a family member that you love deeply. And they're telling you about some of the things that they're thinking about or some of the things that they're doing, activities that they're participating in, and your blood pressure is rising, and you want to scream, you're an idiot! Stop! But you keep your cool. And the more they talk, all of a sudden, like a wave, you hear this voice say, don't you say a word. The last thing you want that person to think is that you're judgmental. Each and every single one of us, we've been in this spot where we don't want anybody to get the wrong idea about us. A while back, there was a game being played on a radio station called What's Worse? And they put two uh, bad ideas out and let people phone in to say which one they thought was worse. And the choices were, what's worse, being a racist or a cannibal? I'm not gonna make you raise your hands. Now listen to me, no doubt about it, racism is an absolutely horrible, horrible deal. It has no place in the heart of a believer, it has no place in the church, and it has no place in our world. But unanimously, all the people who called in and the DJs all said it is worse to be a racist. Now to be a racist, you are looking at somebody based on the color of their skin and you are making snap judgments about how you will treat them and about them. And that is horrible. But being a cannibal means you kill people and eat them. Which is kind of judgmental. Because you have to be like, I think we can catch that one, right? <laughs> now what is... What is wrong with us that we would much rather be perceived as people who would kill people and eat them than as judgmental? But I think that it goes deeper than that for many of us. I think inside of our relationships and inside the people that we interact with, we are nervous about them accepting us at the same rate that we're able to accept them. 
the people we struggle with, their views, their behaviors, we know that we desperately want them to accept us and we don't wanna come across as being judgmental, but yet you know for a fact that they wouldn't be accepting or tolerating of you and your viewpoints if you were to share them. Well, that's the fake news and the bad news, but let me tell you the good news. And as we've been going through this series, we've been talking about fact, faith, then feeling. So we start with the facts that are found in God's word, and that allows us to stretch out in faith, and then we use that faith to interpret our feelings. So the first fact I wanna tell you is that God wants to be intimately involved in your life. Every single one of you, no matter who you are or what you've been doing or what you're in the middle of right now, God desires to have what we call here at the crossing, and you should hear this every week at all of our locations. God wants to have an intimate, personal relationship with you. God doesn't want to like see you out in the window playing in the front yard. He actually wants to be out in the grass with you. Uh, we just moved in. We have some incredible neighbors. Absolutely love them. And the other day, uh, I looked out, and our neighbor lady had brought over toys and was sitting down on a hot day in the shade of the tree, letting my kids run tractors and stuff all over her legs and back. And I'm going, that's, that's a picture of God. He doesn't want a fenced-in backyard where he knows you can go do your own thing and be safe. He actually wants to be out in the yard with you. Here's the deal, each and every single one of us, we go to doctors because we need help with our body. We go to financial experts because we want help with our money. We go to counselors because we want help with the challenges that life has thrown at us. And God's saying, I, I want you to come to me. God is the ultimate expert at absolutely everything. Yeah, that's great, yeah. It's, Absolutely everything. Listen to what it says in Proverbs chapter three, verse five and six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In, everybody say this word, all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. And some of you, the reason you've been having such a curvy life is because you haven't been going to God first, you've been going to him last. It's only after everybody else can't solve your problem that you finally go to him. God has become your last resort instead of your first resort. It'd be like you wanting to work on your jump shot and Steph Curry gave you his cell phone number, but you call everybody else instead of calling him. It's like being stupid with your money and you live next door to Dave Ramsey. And he's always like, hey, if you ever need anything, come on over but you keep doing you, and the expert's right next door. And so many of us would be living a completely different life if we started going to our Heavenly Father first. Uh, last Friday morning, um, my family kind of settled into our new house, and we've been thinking about becoming a part of a pretty exclusive uh, club uh, here in, in, in the Quincy area, and we, you know, we kind of talked about it, thought about it, budgeted it, and so we, we loaded up the family, and, and uh, we decided that we were going to become members of Sam's Club, and uh, <laughs> it's kind of a big deal. Um, I'm not going to lie, we've got two different IDs. Um, we can shop online, we can call and pick up. We, I mean, we didn't get the premium model, but we could have. We got the $40 membership, and uh, we balled it, okay? And uh, while we were going there, uh, we were talking about God, and for some reason, uh, we were talking about prayer, and I was like, Zane and Maddox were in the back, and I go, well, prayer is when you talk to God. And Zane goes, well, how does he talk to us? And I said, when we read our Bible. And Zane said, hurry. Turn around and go home. I want to know what he has to say. And if I hadn't been so focused on bulk purchases, <laughs> I should have turned my car around and gone home and said he loves you. He, I, could have, I, I blew it because I wanted 15 pack of deodorant. I mean... <laughs> When we checked, we dropped off a house payment at Sam's Club. The, the lady who was checking us out was looking at us like, where's the TV show Preppers at? Because you guys are getting a little out of, out of control. But my son Zane was going, he saw that as 
When you read God's word, God's speaking to you. 2 Timothy chapter three says this, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. There are good things that God has in store for you to participate in, but you need to be prepared for those by being a student of his word. God is trying to speak to you. Now, there's not a single thing that you're gonna go through in your life that the word of God will not speak to. For those of you going, it's my life, I can do whatever I want as long as I'm not hurting anyone or hurting anything. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter six. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Even if you lived your life in such a way where you didn't impact anybody else here on earth, your life still impacts him. From what I understand from scripture that every sin that you and I commit is punishable by eternity in hell. And when Jesus died on the cross, he paid that price for each and every single one of your sins and my sins. So when you say you're not hurting him, or you're not hurting anyone. It's bad theology, but lately I've been wrestling with, if I, if I sinned less, would that have impacted how much Jesus would have had to endure on that day? Romans 5, 8 says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That means that when you were at your worst, God was at his best and he paid the price the ultimate price. How much does he love you? At what price did he purchase you? With the life of his very own son. So don't you dare say that it's your life, you can do what you want as long as you're not hurting anyone. It's not your life. It was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. And what we do showed up on that tree. But here's the tougher one is how do I interact in a world where I don't agree with all the people that I interact with and they think that when I, if I love them, I have to agree with them. And that's a lie that we've been fed, that you have to, to love somebody means you have to agree with them and tolerate their behavior. Rick Warren says it this way. Our culture has accepted two huge lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone else's lifestyle, you must fear or hate them. The second is that to love someone means you agree with everything they believe or do. Both are nonsense. You don't have to compromise convictions to be compassionate. Some of you, you keep it under wraps who you voted for in the election, especially this year. Because you're worried that if somebody found out who you voted for, they would stop being your friend which means that your relationships are so shallow that they can't handle somebody believing something different than you. Do you think that Jesus agreed with the people he interacted with? Never. There is not a single time you've read the Bible and Jesus was going, oh yeah, you've nailed it. Well, actually I can think of two, but this is not the day for that. Most of the time, when Jesus interacted with somebody, he's going, I do not agree with you. For instance, when Jesus was hanging out with prostitutes, was Jesus going, this prostitution thing, this is fantastic. <laughs> no, not at all. He completely disagreed with them, but did he love them anyway? Yes. When Jesus was hanging out with the, with the tax collectors who were stealing money from already impoverished people, was Jesus going, this stealing thing's great. He was going, no, that's actually one of the Ten Commandments. But he still said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house. Jesus can love people that he completely disagrees with. When Jesus was interacting with the religious elite, he didn't agree with the Pharisees or the Sadducees ever 
but he still loved them and he still died for them. Jesus interacted with the Romans, the occupied forces. It would be like Russia or Al Qaeda invading the United States and one of their high level lieutenants starts to interact with Jesus and Jesus healed one of his servants. Did, when Jesus healed one of his servants, did that mean that Jesus was a big fan of Rome and all that they were doing? Not at all. Can you see, you can love somebody and not agree with them on anything because Jesus loves you and me and he doesn't agree with you and me about much. He is our perfect role model that you can love somebody and disagree with them and it's okay. So how do we take this message home? The first thing, for many of you in here, you need to know this. God is closer than you think. In fact, at all of our rooms, at all of our locations, even for those of you watching through our different uh, medias online, you need to know this. God is in the room and he wants to take ground in your life today. We call it an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ and you can have it. The Bible records in, with, uh, when Jesus was, or when God was interacting with Elijah, this is what he, he said, he whispered. How close do you have to be to someone to whisper? God is closer than you think. For those of you thinking that it's your life and you can do whatever you want, I want you to realize that your actions and your inactions ripple through eternity. They have impact and they have effect and we need to be good stewards of that. But the biggest one that I wanna unfold in each and every single one of our lives because I believe that this one is resonating and happening with us on a regular basis is we have to learn how to do what it says in Ephesians chapter four, verse 15. We need to learn how to speak the truth in love. Warren Wearsby says, speaking the truth without love is brutality and love without truth is hypocrisy. Bob Russell says, speaking the truth without love is dogmatism and love without truth is sentimentality. But I'm not as smart as those guys, so this is how I say it. Speaking truth without love is lazy and love without truth is lying. Even a rotten parent knows well enough to tell their kids to stop playing in the street. Well, I just don't want to offend them. Well, that car will offend them. So go pull them out of the street and say, no, I love you too much to let you keep playing in the street. You're being intolerant. Yes, I in, will be intolerant of you playing in a place where you could get hit by a car. I love you enough to tell you. And some of us, we struggle at how to do this. We're either all love and no truth, or all truth and no love. But you actually need both. For those of you who don't like the way I say it, let me perhaps do it the way uh, Mary Poppins says it. Just a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Now, if every time one of your kids was sick, all you did was give them sugar, that wouldn't do jack. You give them diabetes, that'd be about it. Well, your cough's fixed, but now you need an insulin shot, right? That would be horrible parenting. Now listen, if all you do is try and throw like uh, NyQuil and whatever, I don't take medicine all that much, so imagine, a, what's the cough medicine? Yeah, cough medicine tastes nasty. Nobody wants to go, man, I could go for some cough medicine this morning. You need a little, that's why they have cherry flavors, right? Trying to help the medicine go down. Listen, you think Mary Poppins was crazy, check out Paul. Colossians chapter four, verse six, let your conversation be always full of grace and seasoned with salt so that uh, you may know how to answer everyone. If you go into your cupboard at home, at least it used to be like this, I'm speaking stuff into existence, you're welcome and you get out like one of those bags of Toll House uh, cookies or uh, chocolate chips, and you go through the recipe and you're getting ready to make it this afternoon for your family, you'll notice one of the uh, ingredients on there is uh, salt. That always is kind of cool to me because uh, cookies are so sweet yet they are still seasoned with too much salt and it's inedible but just enough makes it just right. Cookies without salt 
no bueno. It needs a little bit. Now, some of you, when you kind of think about how you interact with the world, some of you are all salt. You are all truth. That's why you have no friends. You say this all the time. How come none of my kids listen to me? Because that's how you sound. They don't know you love them, even though you're trying to, but you're all truth and you're not loving them. You're being lazy. Find a way to interact with them on their level. Have you noticed that some of the people who've said some of the most hurtful things in your life that have also been some of the most helpful things came from people that you know beyond the shadow of a doubt absolutely love you? And some of you, you guys are all love and no truth. And you're lying to them. To be the people of God and to interact with our community like I know we want to at all of our different locations, we have got to be people who can handle the truth in the right way and we have to interact with the people in two ways. We have to love them and we have to love them enough to speak truth to them. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. As you and I go out and interact with people all around our communities, we need to be people who show them that we love them, but also offer them truth. I want to go back to what it says in first or in Second Timothy. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for somebody he doesn't know any better. What do they need? They need taught. Somebody who knows better, they need rebuked. Hey, knock it off. You know better. Someone who's trying, but they keep missing the mark. They need corrected. And someone who's trying to get some gains, you know what they need? They need training. And as you and I look out at all the different people that God has put in our life, I'm praying that we will be a bright light, speaking the truth, but doing so in love so we can point people to the savior of their souls. And I'm hoping at all of our locations, we'll start making that happen right away, we're moving to a time of decision. This sermon really hits home to the core of who we are and what we believe at the crossing. So I'm so glad that you came today and got to hear it. When I hear things like creator of the universe, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, It makes me think of this massive being in space with this stern face looking down on planet Earth with judgment. Honestly, I imagine Zeus watching the world unfold before him, only intervening when the fate of the world is at stake. But that isn't our God. He's the God that knit you in your mother's womb. He's the one that knows every hair on your head. The fate of the world is the last thing on his mind, but the fate of your soul, that's his burning passion. You are his creation and all he wants is a relationship with you. And when I say relationship, I mean a real relationship, not the go to church on Sunday and sing songs, listen to a sermon, put money in the offering and walk out kind of relationship. God isn't an insurance plan. He is a divine creator who loves you with every fiber of his being. So right now you need to make a decision. Are you gonna live your life with God the watcher where he's writing all of your good and bad deeds down, and you're just crossing your fingers that you come out with more good than bad? Because I've got bad news. That's fake news. If you're using God as an insurance plan, and you think investing an hour in a Sunday service is all you need to do, I've got bad news. That's fake news too. What God has always wanted from you, from the very start with Adam and Eve, is an intimate personal relationship with you to walk with you daily and by your side and guide you through life in his way. It's a tall order and it's gonna be a hard journey, but right now is your time to start down that path. Let's not waste it. Let's go to him right now. We see tragedy in beauty of the cross I feel mystery and wonder of your love Lord, we marvel at the gift you gave to us 
place, I just wanna encourage you to, to pray to God, pray out to Him. there's one thing I know, it's that if God was a distant God, there would be no way he would send his one and only son to die on a cross for you and for me. A distant God doesn't have that much love for the individual in his heart, but our God did. The sacrifice Jesus made on the cross for our sin was the ultimate sign of individual love ever recorded in history. So every week we celebrate it. We take a piece of bread and a cup of juice. It's a representation of his body and his blood and we take it in remembrance of him. Wherever you're watching from, whether you have any bread or juice with you or not, let's spend some time together with Jesus right now.
Thank you for coming together and worshiping with us today. If you have any questions or want to take your relationship with Christ to the next level, I'd love to spend some time talking with you. You can email me at joeyh at thecrossing.net. Also, make sure to hit the give button at the top of the screen or text the crossing online to 77977 to give right from your phone. Thanks for coming and I'll see you next week.